Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are moving from um, ordinary simple statistics uh, from um, uh, central uh, measures of central tendency or dispersion or correlations to a little bit more advanced topics now. And in this lecture, we'll be discussing random variables and uh, basic theory about probability. It is a very uh, basic introduction to random variables and, and uh, probability. Now, uh, probability is, is a measure between 0 and 1 of the likelihood that an event will occur. Um, what is the probability of, uh, of uh, rain today? What is the probability of uh, your favorite team winning uh, the match? Um, there are three views for probability. Uh, there is a classical definition which is based on theory. There is one based on relative frequency uh, which comes from uh, empirical data. And then there is subjective uh, views about uh, probability and that's basically uh, based on judgment. Now the, the subjective definition uh, is basically um, you, you, you can ask what is the probability that Germany will win the World Cup, the next World Cup, uh, the Soccer World Cup or what is the probability that the um, um, stock index or a stock exchange would increase by 10 percent in, in the next week. Um, you can have some subjective uh, uh, definitions for this. The uh, experimental definition um, of uh, probability is based on experiments and outcomes and, and an experiment is the observation of some activity uh, or the act of taking a measurement. Um, for example, if you are working in quality control and um, you're working in a, in a factory that produces cereals or leather jackets and um, you are measuring the, the outcome, um, you're measuring the, the, let's say you're interested in determining how many uh, cereal boxes are underweight. So you are weighing each and every cereal box that comes out of the production line. So that is the experiment where each and every box or if there is every other box or every tenth box is being weighed, that is the experiment. The outcome is a particular result. Um, if we work uh, with the same example of cereal boxes coming out of a production line um, and we are weighing each box the outcome could be that what are the proportions of the sample that is underweight. If the weight is supposed to be 550 grams, uh, then we would be interested in determining the proportion of the boxes uh, that are underweight. So that would be an outcome. The experiment would be the act of measuring the weight of each box or each uh, every tenth box or whatever the sampling uh, procedure that we uh, implement. Um, again, uh, we define an outcome. We specify that a certain weight is defined as the underweight, uh, that is weight that is considered to be underweight. And if there is um, um, a large number or a small number of boxes that are underweight, then we would call that uh, outcome as underweight and the proportion of those boxes would be considered uh, undesirable and, and faulty. Now, an event is a collection of one or more outcomes of an experiment. And in, an experiment uh, could have, uh, say, a sample of 25 items, and the outcome could be the number of those that are defectives. And an event could be um, 0 or 1, or it could be um, 2, 3, or 4, or, or it could be 3 or 5. Now, I would like to draw your attention to the slide here um, uh, so that uh, we can illustrate the, uh, the definition um, of events and outcomes. Now, let's say we have an event which is uh, an experiment where we looked at a sample of 25 items and the outcome was um, a certain number of defectives. And the events are defined as, and let's define A as 0 or 1, B as 2, 3, or 4, and C as 3 or 5. Now, two events are mutually exclusive if the occurrence of one, any one means that the, none other, that the other one can occur let me rephrase it. Two events are mutually exclusive if the occurrence of one, uh, any one means that the none of the other can occur at the same time. Now, if you look at events A and events B, event A is 0 and 1, and event B is 2, 3, or 4. These are mutually exclusive, and this graphic at the bottom, bottom left, shows that A is and B are mutually exclusive. On the other hand, B and C has some commonality. The, the number 3 is common. So there is some overlap between B and C, and if you were to represent this graphically, you see B here and C here, and this is the common element. So A and B are mutually exclusive, whereas B and C are not mutually exclusive. Now, 
as I mentioned earlier that the probably probability associated with any outcome must be between 0 and 1 and sum of all the possible outcomes always or must be equal to 1 so um, it lies between 0 and 1 for example if you were to um, um, uh, toss a coin the probability of getting head or tail um, is 0.5 if it's a, an, uh, if it's a, a fair coin and then the sum of all the possibilities uh, you know head or tail 0.5 plus 0.5 it becomes uh, 1 so again uh, the probability associated with an outcome lies between 0 and 1 and if you sum up the sum up all the possibilities uh, the probability of all the possibilities it should equal 1 so the probability of any event is the sum of the outcomes that compose that event and if event a and b are mutually exclusive then probability of a or probability that a or b is equal to uh, probability of a plus probability of b which means that if you're looking at the probability that either a or b may occur then you sum up the individual probabilities and you get that however if the events a and b are not mutually exclusive then the probability of event either event a or b would be the sum of the two possible probabilities that is probability a plus probability b minus the probability that a and b may occur at the same quickly moving from uh, probability to random variables a random variable is a numerical description of the outcome of an experiment and random variables are always uh, denoted by capital letters and um, X would be uh, capital X would be the random variable and the small X would be representing the individual uh, values um, or specific values of that random variable so the capital letters depict or denote uh, the random variable and the individual specific values are donated by uh, small letters the random variables could be discrete with a finite or infinitely countable number of values for example the number of inaccurate orders or a number of imperfections um, in a car um, these could be discrete and random numbers and the random numbers could also be continuous uh, having any real value possibly within some limited range for example the mean weight of sample of cereal boxes so if you're observing cereal boxes and you're weighing them the average weight of say 50 samples would give you 50 averages and those could be continuous and that would be an example of a continuous random variable whereas if you're counting the number of imperfections in a brand new car and and you're doing it for 50 cars those numbers would uh, those numbers that uh, that you will count would also be random but they will be discrete random numbers moving from the definition of random numbers to what is a probability distribution and the probability distribution is a theoretical model of the possible values a random number or a random variable may assume along with the probability of occurrence so um, if you have a random variable and if you uh, are looking at all the possible values that it may assume coming out of a theoretical construct that would be called a probability distribution and probability distributions may be defined for both continuous and for discrete variables random variables to illustrate these concepts that I've just explained um, let me take the example of two dice um, let's think of a dice that's red and another dice that's black and if you throw these two dice uh, you can get a certain number of number you can get certain number of uh, outcomes and we'll try to come up with a probability distribution using those numbers now the probability function which is represented here as f of x um, is specifies the probability of each discrete outcome now we're looking at discrete random variables um, let's look at two specific properties of uh, discrete random variables that the probability function of a discrete random variable uh, would be would vary between 0 and 1 um, it would be greater than 0 and less than equal to 1 greater than equal to 0 and less than equal to 1 and that sum of all uh, probability functions would equal to 1 now let's say we roll two dice and uh, when we do that um, both red and black dice may get 1 each um, and if this is 1 on both dice then 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 and if you look at the screen here the 
uh, the sum of two dice could be two and there's only one possibility out of 36 possibilities that the two dice that that, that we will get two from our both dice now if we roll the dice again the possibility of getting three has two outcomes let's say um, the red dice has one on it and the black dice has two that's one outcome and we can reverse this such that the red dice has two and the black dice has one on it and therefore we have two outcomes so the possibilities of getting uh, various outcomes by rolling a dice of rolling two dices are two three four five six all the way to twelve and the only way you can get twelve is if both dice have six on them and there's only one possibility of getting twelve and therefore the 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 probability function for twelve is one by thirty six one divided by thirty six so of all the thirty six outcomes there's only one which will give you twelve and there's only one that will give you two so that's why we have the probability function for the outcome two as one divided by thirty six and the probability function of uh, twelve uh, or the outcome twelve is also one divided by thirty six so if you were to plot this, um, um, and before we plot it, let me just uh, briefly talk about the cumulative distribution function. And you notice that the probability um, function was uh, represented by a small f of x, a function of x, but with a small letter f. And the cumulat cumulative distribution function is represented by capital F. And it is the addition of the, it, it, it accumulates the probability. So if you look at it here, the small of f, x, f of x is 1 by 36. And the next one, which is 3, is 2 by 36. But the cumulative would be 1 plus 2, 3 by 36. Then 3 plus 3, 6 by 36. 6 plus 4, 10 by 36. So it accumulates and it adds up the probability function from the last one and then adds it to the next one and so on and so forth so that it moves from the lowest to the last outcome and it becomes 1 because it would be 36 by 36 and if you look at it here it's 35 divided by 36 for 11 and for the outcome 12 it would be 35 plus 1 36 by 36 which becomes 1 and I think if you were to you know do the same in, in, in Excel or any other software you can uh, look at these outcomes there are these distinct outcomes of rolling two dice these are the probabilities that would that are associated with them and you can find the cumulative by adding these two and then by adding these two and so on and so forth and we have plotted these two probabilities the the probability function is like this in maroon it rises and it that's it's the maximum for seven and then it goes down from there whereas the cumulative probability function continues to increase till it hits 12 where it reaches or approaches one now the probability density function for a continuous random variable um, it's a continuous function that describes the probability of outcomes for the random variable x and the histogram, a histogram of sample data approximates the shape of the underlying density function and in order to illustrate this point let me show you an example from uh, Montreal we have data for Montreal at the at the neighborhood level and we have uh, the city Montreal divided into 800 or 798 neighborhoods and if we were to plot the value of percentage of females uh, living within each neighborhood um, uh, you would notice that you know if the population is divided between males and females then the percentage of females should be around 50 percent and that's what you see here that the distribution um, is, is symmetric around 50 but then you also have neighborhoods where the percentage of females is as low as 10 and you have uh, another neighborhoods where percentage of females is 90% that is 90% of the population is female in certain neighborhoods and in other only 10% of the population is female and but in re but the the main data set the peak is around 50% which suggests that you know half of the population is male and the other half is female so this curve that you see uh, which is uh, uh, approximating a normal distribution is the the curve that shows the density function for the uh, variable percentage females in the neighborhood and this is for the 2001 census data so this is more or less what I showed here a probability density function for a continuous variable now there are certain properties of the probability density functions 
the function is uh, greater than equal to zero for all values, um, possible outcomes. And if you were to look at the total area under the curve of a probability distribution function, um, that is equal to one. And there are always infinitely many values of x, so that the probability that the variable x would assume a specific value x, that is small x, is equal to zero. And we can only define probabilities over intervals. Uh, that is, we can say that the probability that x is greater than c and lower than d, um, we, can, we can define these probabilities over intervals, but it's difficult to find probability at a specific value because there are infinitely, uh, infinite number of uh, values that uh, the variable may take. And it is more meaningful to look at the probability in terms of uh, intervals. As far as cumulative distribution function is concerned, again being represented by uh, capital F as a function of x, it specifies the probability that the random variable x will be less than or equal to certain value x, that is probability of uh, capital X is less than or equal to x, and the f of x is equal to the area under f of x, small f of x, to the left of x. Now, um, these statements are difficult to understand if you uh, read, um, but they are easier to understand when I illustrate these, these uh, concepts uh, using actual uh, data. Uh, the probability that x is between two distinct values a and b is the area under the distribution function of this, uh, that area that lies between the two values a and b, such that the cumulative distribution function of f of b, uh, when subtracted from f of a, will give you that value. Now let's consider normal distribution. Uh, it's a familiar bell-shaped curve, and um, normal distribution, the theoretical distribution, is symmetric. That is, the median is the same as mean, which is the same as mode, and half the area is on either side of the mean. Um, so the range is unbounded in, in normal distribution. That is, when you consider the tails, and here's the tail of the distribution, the tail, um, the, the curve never touches the x-axis here. And this is what we mean by the fact that the range is unbounded. And the, the, the mean is represented as m. The variance is represented as a square. And the density function is written as f of x exponential x minus mu. That is the observation minus the mean divided by 2 times the uh, standard deviation square or variance. And these deviations are squared with a negative sign divided by in the square root 2 times pi times variance. Now this is the theoretical construct that gives us the normal distribution, which looks like this. Also related with normal distribution is the concept of the standard normal or standard normal distribution. And the standard normal distribution is identified with a mean 0 and the standard deviation or variance of 1. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the graphic here, this uh, graphic is the bell curve shape. This is the standard normal. And the area under this curve is equal to 1. And the mean value is 0. And if you look at the variance for this data, it is going to be 1. And the way we compute, uh, compute in a standard normal is we take a data set um, for all values x and subtract mean from it and divide it by its uh, standard deviation. And the resulting z statistic bears these, these uh, uh, characteristics that if you compute the mean value, it will be 0. And if you compute the standard devi variance, it would be equal to 1. Now, allow me to illustrate this concept um, uh, mathematically. Um, and I can again show this in Excel. So we will uh, look at the life expectancy at birth um, data from a uh, human development report. And we will take a subset of the data set from there and bring it into Excel and do the calculations there. So I have already taken a subset and, and illustrate these concepts. So what I have here is the life expectancy at birth for a select few countries. And the, the life expectancy is expressed in, uh, in years. So this country has 71.3, whereas one at the bottom has 71. Now you see here that I have also computed the average, which is 67 years, and also the standard deviation, which is 6.67 years. So with this, I took the uh, average value um, and subtracted the observed value from the, the average value um, and 
and then divided it by the standard deviation. So uh, what you see here is 71.3 minus 67.06 divided by 6.67 and the result is 0 0.634. And I have done the same over and over again for all these observations and I got these numbers. And these numbers here then become the standard normal. Whenever you take the observation, subtract the mean from it, and divide it by the standard deviation, you have uh, um, transformed that variable, and that's called the Z transformation. And once you have done this, I have computed the mean value again here of the transformed variable, and you will notice that the mean value is zero. And I've also computed the variance by saying, you know, using the Excel's formula variance, and then selected the uh, observation, and the variance is equal to one. So if you Z, tr uh, if you uh, transform the variable, and after transforming the variable, you compute the, the average value, or the standard deviation, or the variance, the variance would be equal to one, and the standard deviation um, of one would also be one. Uh, because the uh, standard deviation is the square root of variance and the square root of 1 is always 1. So you just saw here that the standard normal distribution after the, the transformation returns the mean value of 0 and the variance equal to 1. Once the data are converted into standard normal, um, then you can actually plot it. And one of the um, interesting characteristics of the normal distribution or density curve is that uh, one can have an idea of how the data are dispersed and uh, what percentage of the uh, area under the curve or what percentage of the observations uh, for, for coming out of a data that are normally distributed are within a certain uh, interval of the mean. Now, if a data are assumed to be normally distributed, um, one, can, one can see from this graphic here that uh, roughly 68.3 percent of the observations are within one standard deviation of the mean. And um, if you move from one to two standard deviations, and uh, uh, for instance, if you were to look at it here, so between two standard deviations, one would have roughly 95%, 95.4% of the observations within two standard deviations, and almost 99.7% of the observations within two, st uh, three standard deviations of the mean. Now, from a practical point of view, from operations research point of view, um, there are very useful implications and applications of uh, normal distribution functions. Um, in, in supply chain and logistics uh, or in retail um, sales and, and, and planning processes, one can actually apply this uh, knowledge and, and make some assumptions or, or some idea of how um, future observations could be. Um, to give you an example, um, let's say that there is a, um, a data set where uh, we know that uh, there's a product that we sell, and the customer demand on average is 750 units per month. So you're selling something, for instance, if you own a shoe store and you're selling 750 shoes um, every month, and you know that there's a standard deviation, uh, this is the measure of dispersion, and the standard deviation is about 100 units per month. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the probability that in the next month, uh, or in, in the current month, um, you may be able to sell 900 uh, shoes, um, or you may be able to sell more than 700 shoes, um, then um, you can actually use the, the standard normal um, conversion uh, to get the answer. And I have illustrated, I will illustrate it here. Um, now, if you, if you were to focus on the, on the, on the slide here, uh, I'm trying to determine the probability that the sales would exceed 900 units or 900 shoes per month. And we are assuming we are dealing with shoes. Now, as I told you earlier, that uh, on average, we are selling 750 shoes. The standard deviation of sales is about 100 units. So 750 shoes is right here. Um, and um, we are working with standard deviation of 100. And we are trying to determine the, um, the probability for sales for 900. Now, this is our x. 900 is our x. And our mean is 750. This is mu. And the standard deviation is 100. So x minus mu divided by standard deviation. So 900 minus 750 would be 150. And if I were to divide 150 by 100, 
I'm left with 1.5. So this is the standard normal transformation. If you look at the actual data set, if this 750 is the mean, and I will draw a line, drop a line from the top uh, to show you if this is the mean, um, and this is 900 because mean is at 750, the standard deviation is 100, and I'm trying to determine what is the probability that I would sell more than 900 shoes. Now, because I'm trying to determine the probability of selling more than 900 shoes, I'm interested in this part of the curve, this area under the curve here, which is already grayed out, but I've also circled it. Now, in, just for the argument's sake, if I were interested in the probability of selling at least 900 shoes, I would be looking on the other side of the curve, which is the area to the left, all this area. Right? So, so this very small area that you see here, this area under the curve, and remember that if once you transform something in, as standard normal, that area under the curve becomes 1, and we would like to know what is the probability. So once we have transformed, we get this number as 1.5, and a standard normal looks like this. So uh, the mean is 0, and for a standard normal distribution, um, the, the variance or standard deviation is equal to 1, and this 900 here becomes 1.5 from here. And the goal is to determine the area under this curve. If the total area under the curve is 1, what is the area under the curve here? So we determine this using either Excel or um, using um, R. Let me take you to R to, to see if we can do this through R Commander. And I will switch to now R. And if you look at the R Commander, which um, um, the, the menu for distributions is right here, and I will click on distributions, and then I will click on con continuous distributions, and I will click on normal distributions, and then I will click on normal probabilities. This is the second option under normal quantiles. So once again, click on distributions, then continuous distributions, then click on normal distribution, and then normal probabilities. After clicking on normal probabilities, um, I am in, I, I'm asked to give the variable value. What value am I interested in? Remember that I'm interested in determining the probability of selling more than 900 shoes. So the variable of interest or the value of interest is 900. So let me enter 900 here. Now, the mean value, the mu, if you recall, as I said earlier, is 750. That is, we are selling. Uh, in the past, we have sold at uh, on average 750 shoes. Um, on average, and the standard deviation of our sales is on average, uh, or if the mean is 750, the standard deviation was 100. Here. Now, I am selecting the upper tail. Uh, there's an option to select either the lower tail of the curve or the upper tail of the curve. Because we are interested in values, um, in, in the probability of selling more than 900, I would select the upper, uh, the upper tail. If I were interested in uh, selling, uh, finding the probability of sales of less than 900, or at least 900, then I would have selected the lower tail. So I select upper tail here, and I click OK. And I will highlight this command here in the script window. You would notice that uh, our commander has um, executed a command uh, where it has uh, its p-norm. And you, it, it's tells the 900 value, the 750 average, the standard deviation of 100. And um, you don't really need to learn these commands. The beauty of our commander is that you point and click, and it executes these commands. But they would be there for your uh, reference. Now, if I were to take you to the output window, and at the bottom of the output window, I see this uh, value of 0 0.0668 or 0 0.067. And this is the value. Uh, for the probability. If you were to multiply this by 100, um, you would notice that uh, this is about 6.7 percent. So the probability of uh, selling more than 900 shoes is, in fact, 6.7 percent. So if somebody were uh, to ask you, what is, what is the probability that you're going to sell 900 shoes, and you, s you were to say, well, I'm pretty confident we sell 750. Uh, 900 is not that far off, and actually it is, because the probability of selling uh, 900 shoes is, in fact, very slim. So it's about 6.7%. Now, 
Uh, let's uh, return to the, the spreadsheet here, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides, and so here the you, you see that we have written down that if the area is equal to 0 0.5 minus 0 0.433, which is again 0 0.067 or 6.7 percent. One thing of interest to know is why this is 0 0.5, why it's not 1, and as I mentioned, that the area under the curve of standard normal distribution is 1, whereas I am here um, displaying 0.5 minus something else. The reason is because um, remember that the standard normal distribution is symmetric, so um, the area under the curve to the right and to the left of the mean, the upper tail and the lower tail, is identical. It's 0.5 to this side and 0.5 to this side. So, so um, if you know the area under the curve here, which we determined to be 0.433, and we know that from here onwards to the end, the area is 0.5, we subtract this area, which is 0.4332. This is used uh, for the highlighter to indicate. This 0.4332 is the area that I'm highlighting right now. So knowing that this is the area under the curve, uh, up to this point, 1.5, um, the uh, the remaining area here would be uh, 0.5 minus 0.4332, which becomes 0 0.0668 or 6.7 percent. Now, how do we know what is the probability, um, how to determine the probability of selling at least or more than 700 shoes? Um, so again, if you look at the, the the image here, the mean sales are 750, and we are trying to figure out the probability of selling more than 700 shoes. So again, um, let me take a blue color here, right here. So the area that we are interested in is this part of the curve, right? and this is the area that we are interested in. So we know the standard deviation is 100. We know the mean is 750. And we are trying to determine the probability of selling more than 700. So this is the area of the, under the curve. So again, we take x minus mu divided by 100. And this is minus 0 0.5. And if this is 0 uh, on the standard normal, and this is minus 0 0.5, then this area becomes 0 0.1915. 1915. And the way to work with it in uh, our commander is I will go back to distributions. I'll click on continuous distributions, then on normal distribution, and then on normal probabilities. And this time around, I'll uh, type 700. The mean is 750. And the standard deviation, as we know, is 100. And I select upper tail because we are interested in determining the uh, values exceeding 700, so sales of uh, 700 and more, and I click OK, and the answer I obtain is 0 0.69, or roughly 69%. And if I were to um, take you to the, to the other slide just to confirm, um, the answer is 69%. Okay, now let's uh, return to the, to the graphic here for one second, just to see the Remember that this part of the curve is 0 0.5, right? This, this, the white part of the curve. And let me just make sure, highlight it or create some stripes so there's no confusion. This area is 0 0.5, okay. And the difference between 0 and, uh, let me make it real clear, the difference between 0 and minus 0 0.5 is 0.19. So this shaded area that you see here between this part and this part here, this is 0 0.195, 1915. So if I were to add 0 0.5 and then 0 0.1915, I would get 0 0.69. And the same answer we obtained through our commander. But the question is, how do I know these areas? there another way of doing it? Yes, there are. There are two ways, uh, other than our commander. 
Uh, you can, um, in fact, uh, use Microsoft Excel to do it, and I will illustrate it in a second. And in fact, you can refer to any statistics books. And these numbers, these areas under the curve for um, the standard normal uh, values are reported uh, at the end of uh, most books on statistics as an appendix. And these areas under the curves could be uh, computed or, or not computed, but in fact referred to directly from those tables. And it's a standard practice. Almost all books on statistics uh, do carry these tables. Though it is becoming increasingly um, unpopular because uh, now software are so widely available that you can compute these values by yourself. But there was a time when these values were published uh, as tables because the technology wasn't there to compute readily uh, these values. Now, how would you do this in Excel? Well, let me show you in Excel. Um, the, the way to do it in Excel would be as follows. So we have, I have typed up these values just for reference already. The mean value is 750. The standard deviation is 100. And the earlier um, value that we were interested in was to determine the um, probability of selling more than 900 shoes, where on average we are selling 750 with a standard deviation of 100 shoes per month. So I entered these values. And the probability is computed by this formula here, which is highlighted in the formula uh, window in, in Excel. The formula is norm dist, N-O-R-M-D-I-S-T. And then you enter this by um, first entering the x value, which is uh, 900, then the mean value, which is uh, um, 750, then the standard deviation. And, and Excel actually would, all, all would offer you these, these out here uh, when you are entering the formula. So you enter x, mean, standard deviation. And then there's a, there's a thing called cumulative because you're trying to determine the cumulative distribution. So to enter two there. This is Excel specific. So if you were to know, would like to learn more about this, I would suggest that you uh, consult the help files. This is fairly um, well documented in, in the help files in Microsoft Excel. And then the probability is obtained right there, 93.3. And this is the same as we obtained uh, with R. And that now, sorry, the R1 reported the probability as 0 0.06. So you would say, why 0 0.06 or 6.68%? This is the probability of selling at least 900. The probability of selling more than 900 would be 100 minus this. And I just computed this by, by, subtracting, um, by subtracting this probability from 1. And that is the 6.68% is the probability of selling greater than 900 shoes, and 93.3% is the probability of selling less than 900 shoes. So what is the probability that you would sell less than 900 shoes? 93.3%. And again, if you were to determine the probability of selling more than 900 shoes, the probability could only go up to 100. You subtract 93.3 from uh, 100, and you're left with 6.68%. Now, let's have um, another value. Let's say um, someone comes to you, and you're the manager of a retail operation. And um, let's keep the same average value, and let's keep the same standard deviation. And the manager comes to you. You are the data analyst for, uh, for your, uh, your firm. And the question is posed to you, OK, we know the probability of selling um, 900 shoes, but what is the probability of selling 950 shoes? Right? And obviously, if the probability of selling 900 shoes um, is 6.6%, you can make the assumption that the probability of selling 950 shoes would be actually less than 6.6%. And it, if you have tabulated, if you have uh, entered these numbers the way I have done it here, um, the answer would just uh, emerge automatically um, by typing 950. And I say Enter. And the, the cells are updated automatically in Excel. And the probability turns out to be 2.28%. So this is the probability, 2.3% probability, that uh, we, will, we will may be able to sell more than 950 shoes in a given month, given that on average we sell 750 shoes and with a standard deviation of 100. Now, 950 is 750 plus two standard deviations, right? But the probability is, is very small. And that probability is, in fact, 
captured here. It is the very tail end of this this distribution that would be covering the uh, area under the curve and for 950. And just to uh, show you once again in um, in um, our commander uh, this time around, I will not use the the same approach that I did previously. And this now I'm introducing you another way of doing things rather quickly in our commander. Instead of uh, clicking on distributions, then continuous distribution, normal distribution, and then um, normal probabilities and entering the numbers again because this uh, dialog box does not retain the values that we entered last time. It doesn't retain uh, hold them in its memory. So I have to enter the values, the mean value and the standard deviation along with the new value for the x variable um, every time. Another way of avoiding this is to actually benefit from the, 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 the script that the software creates every time we execute it. So um, here I have uh, used the mean 750 and standard deviation of 100 and the x value was 900. I can change it to 950 and I can either click on submit or I can say control R and I'll say control while holding the control key I press the R and I get the, the value updated at the bottom which is 0 0.022 and you know that if you multiply 0 0.0 2275 with 100 and again press control R and the answer is 2.28 or 2.275 which is the same as one we have obtained by using Excel 2.28 percent. So um, an extremely useful tool, an extremely beneficial tool to, for planning purposes. Um, that you can once you know the normal this once you know that you have the mean and average value and the standard deviation and you have uh, reasons to believe that your data are normally distributed you can um, create the standard normal and and do the calculations either by using a statistical table from a book or you can actually compute these in um, uh, Excel or our commander I would encourage you to use our commander because you can become more proficient and you can do actually more involved analysis than one would do with Excel. And um, again, there's no limit to the, the range of values that you can check. Uh, just to show you uh, one more last illustration on this very point, what if I change the mean? Um, I keep the 950 as the variable. That is, the um, the assumption would be that uh, what is the we would like to know what is the probability of selling 950 shoes in a given month. But then we we got the updated data from our uh, uh, from from sales, and we found out that actually our we are now selling on average 850 shoes uh, per month, and our standard deviation is uh, um, uh, 175 shoes per month, and this and notice that with these new numbers um, uh, the average sales of 850 shoes per month and the standard deviation of 175 uh, the probability of selling uh, more than 950 shoes increases from 2 point some percent to 28.4 percent again as more data are bec uh, become available to you you can actually test the probability for different outcomes you uh, determine the values that you're interested in get the latest data uh, for uh, averages and standard deviations, plug those in and you would know the probability of selling um, or probability of an event occurring or a, and in this case we were interested in sales for 950. Now another interesting question could be that uh, what is the number of sales that would occur for a given probability? Um, for instance, uh, what is the um, sales, uh, how many shoes in this case would we sell um, uh, when our sales exceed 90% of the time? Uh, that is, uh, the sales that we would have, uh, what is the number of sales that reach the probability of 90%? And in this case, the sales, the number of shoes being sold um, or could, could only exceed 10% of the time. And the, the way to do this is, is slightly different and um, I will first illustrate this in, uh, in 
first illustrate describe this on the graph and then illustrate first in our commander under the area under the curve for a standard normal distribution is 1 and we know that the the mean for us is uh, 750 and, uh, and the standard deviation is 100 and we are interested in determining the the area uh, which is right here 0.1 uh, which we're not interested actually my apologies let me rephrase it we know the area is under the curve the area under the curve is uh, 1 and we know we would like to determine the number of shoes being sold here where the area to the right end of the tail the upper tail is 0.1 that is the sales that would one one would reach 90% um, of the time or in this case the sales that would would only be reached only 10% of the time right so the area is here but this time we are not trying to determine the area under the curve but actually the value of for sales so the way to do it in in uh, our commander is slightly different and uh, show it to you here um, you click on distributions and you click on continuous distributions then on normal and this time around you click on normal quantiles rather than normal probabilities that I've been uh, doing the uh, earlier I click on normal quantiles and I would like to enter the probability point one that is the probability that one would exceed this uh, sales value only 10 percent of the time the mean remains 750 and the standard deviation remains 100 again 750 is the average number of shoes we sell in a month and our standard deviation is 100 shoes per month and we would like to know the um, sales that would exceed only 10 percent of the time and again I will select upper tail here and I click OK and the number the value is 878 I have highlighted it for you um, this value tells us that um, if you were to go back to the curve that that eight eight hundred and seventy eight shoes uh, is the value which would be exceeded only ten percent of the time and this number this question mark then becomes eight seventy eight right in Excel the the the, the keyword is norm inverse um, and this is the Excel specific here command you have to type norm inverse and then point nine which is the, the, the area here and then the mean value and the standard deviation and you get the same value of 878 and that's 878 from our command as well and in this case um, the, um, the the values on the 0 0.1552 um, you just uh, cons consider it as an integer because um, in this particular example we are, you are looking at selling shoes um, anything um, uh, less than one is meaningless because you don't sell 0.15 shoes. You either sell a shoe or you don't sell a shoe. So 878 is a more meaningful answer. Now, if I were to go back here and remember this time around, I'm instead of typing, um, I will say uh, change the values. Remember the the whenever you execute a command in our commander, um, it types up uh, the script, and in the script will, uh, window where the lower tail is false. I would select lower tail is true and instead of typing it just true I would say capital T and it would entertain uh, it as true and you can get the, the lower tail value of 625. Moving forward, um, if you were to consider this slide uh, what we have done is we have provided you um, the commands with the commands in Excel uh, so that if you were to practice this in, in Excel remember that the first command is norm dist you enter the x value the mean value the standard deviation and select 2 for cumulative and you would have these values reported here for 750 the standard normal transformation gave us 1.5 uh, which gave us the value as 93.3 and this is to the to the to the left of the um, value of interest for the upper tail you subtract this value from 100 and you're left with 6.6 Now, a quick word about sampling distribution. Um, the key question that we are interested in is how good is an estimate of the mean obtained from a sample? Um, when you compute a mean and you're using sample data, you would like to know if this mean is, uh, is significant. And the sampling distribution of the mean is the distribution of the means of all possible samples of all fixed sizes from some population. This, this suggests that you know if you have um, a population and you draw um, 
a thousand samples from that population and from those thousand samples you compute a thousand values for means then the the distribution of the mean from those would be the sampling distribution um, uh, that we will get now un understanding sampling distributions is the key to statistical inference and our goal is to figure out that this mean from one sample is, is statistically significant and, and is meaningful. The expected value of the sample mean is the population mean, uh, which means that we believe that the average value that we have obtained or estimated from our sample is the, the same as the population mean, that if we had access to the entire population and we would have computed um, the average for a given variable, um, that value would have been the same as the value that we have computed through this sample. And the variance of the sample mean is uh, S sigma square divided by N, whereas the sigma square is the variance of the population. Um, the variance of the, the standard deviation of the sample mean is called the standard error of the mean, and that is uh, the uh, very standard deviation divided by the square root of number of observations in our data. A quick word about the central limit theorem, theorem, and if you were to focus on the on the slide here, um, basically, if you have the sample, si if the sample size is large enough, and by that we mean that you would have at least 30 observations, but more so around 100, um, you get. I would consider that as a reasonable uh, sample. But then again, the re the size of the population determines what is uh, a reasonable sample size. But if you have a large enough sample. The sampling distribution of the mean of that sample is approximately normal regardless of the distribution of the population. And if the po population is normal, then the sampling distribution of the mean is exactly normal for any num uh, number of observations. Uh, it could be 30 or less, but if the population is normal, then the sampling distribution will always be. Uh, sampling distribution of the mean is exactly normal as well. Another quick word about confidence intervals. Um, a confidence interval is an interval estimated that specifies the likelihood that the interval contains the true population parameter. Now, every time we estimate the, um, the sample mean, uh, we would then get a confidence interval around that mean. If, let's say, the sample mean is uh, 750, uh, the confidence interval could be 650 to 800. Um, that confidence interval, uh, which we can compute, um, gives us an idea that the the true population mean um, lies within that range. And the level of confidence, which is 1 minus alpha, is the probability uh, prior to sampling that the confidence interval contains the true population parameter. And it's usually expressed as a percentage. So, uh, and, uh, so the confident level of confidence is expressed as like 95% confidence level. And again, it's the probability uh, that the this the confidence interval that we are working with uh, contains the true population. So this concludes our uh, discussion on uh, uh, how we can use standard normal distribution to do uh, to find some some interesting probabilities. And I hope that you will take the advantage of our commander and practice with the with our commander as well as in Excel to see how you can apply the normal distribution and standard normal um, to, to gain uh, interesting insights about your data sets. If you have um, data sets for which you know the, norm, uh, the averages and standard deviations, I would use, encourage you to apply those values and see if the, the results that you get from using our commander are meaningful and helpful in your